our final panel has the monumental task of weaving together the themes that we've addressed so far today. Good luck. Um, we, we, we've touched on, on some pretty meaty, meaty topics. We've touched on food as medicine, precision health, collaborative care, and um, now we're gonna talk about how we can pull these topics together um, and, and enhance the care throughout our communities. Food system intervention combines many of the lessons and applies them to proactive change that we can make that can have significant positive impact in our communities and to our families. To help us shine a light on these topics, we have a panel here moderated by Georgia Parakis. Georgia is a professor uh, in management and in operations research, statistics, and operations management at the M MIT Sloan School of Management, where she has been. Do you want me to say how long or not? It doesn't matter. <laughs> um, her research, in her research, she investigates the theory and practice of analytics. She's particularly interested in how to solve complex and practical problems in pricing, revenue management, supply chain logistics, and energy applications, among others. Um, I'm sure that we'll manage the panel effectively and be able to take a few questions at the end. And Georgia, would you please introduce the panel? Absolutely. So first of all, I want to thank everybody for staying so late. Uh, to me, it was a very exciting day with different topics uh, that the different panels and speakers touched upon. And uh, I am very lucky to have here a panel on uh, food, the food system and how it can help curb chronic illness. We all know that basically unhealthy food is associated with the prevalence of chronic disease from different types of cancers to diabetes to heart disease. And I think the difficult task that this panel has, as they represent different sectors of the food system, it is to try to see how the different sectors they represent can come together and provide discussion on the challenges uh, of how we can improve access to healthy food, in particular for people who do not have access, who live on food deserts and so forth. But since the goal here is not for me to speak, but really for the panel, uh, what I'm going to do is introduce each one of them, and then I will start asking them questions. And by the way, People can actually raise their hands to any of the panelists. Uh, I'm putting them on the spot and ask questions as we go along. But if people are more comfortable, they can also leave their questions at the end. So I'm going to start actually to the person on my left, who is Lisa Sebesta. So Lisa was actually the founder of Citari Capital. And she works with investors to evaluate and manage impactful direct investments in private companies. She's also the managing partner at Fresh Source Capital LLC and the general partner in Fresh uh, Source Capital Fund One. Uh, Lisa actually has, apart from her undergraduate degree from Holy Cross, she also has a master's from the Fletcher School at Tufts. And uh, an interesting fact is she's also a CFA chart holder. Uh, and she, the fact that she has a degree from Tufts connects her <laughs> with the next panelist, um, who is basically Tim Griffin. So Lisa represents the private for-profit sector, if you like, but Tim actually represents academia, because Tim is an associate professor and also the division chair at the Agriculture, Food, and Environment at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University, so that you see the similarities. Uh, and he actually is teaching courses in US agriculture and agricultural science and policy, and does a lot of research on regional food systems and climate change and their impacts in uh, agriculture. And then I'm going to go to Doug, Doug Caldwell, 
And uh, Doug is actually the executive director of the Boston Area Gleaners. And she was, in fact, the first employee in 2010 when uh, th this is basically a nonprofit organization that I believe provides extreme service to different communities by basically working with local pantries and major distributors in the greater uh, Boston Food Bank, for example, in order to be able to bring food to uh, these areas so that underrepresented and, uh, and de food desert can actually access them. And uh, an interesting fact about Doug is that she actually has been a carpenter, from what I understand, uh, in her earlier days and maybe even today. I'm, I'm sorry, what did you say? That you were a carpenter. Um, oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, which I thought would be an interesting uh, fact that the audience would like to know. And last but not least, we go to Sue, Sue Aderbois, who is the director of food and strategy at the state of, of Rhode Island since 2016. Uh, and so that I don't spend time to talk more about each of the panelists, you can see that each of them represents a different sector from the left from a for-profit to academia uh, to non-profit to policy and government. And so what I want to do is have a, a discussion by me asking questions, but also potentially with your help, to try to understand the, the food system as a system and how the different sectors that they represent interact, what are the challenges, and what actually works well together. So I maybe will start now from the opposite direction and uh, go to Sue and ask her how does she see her role um, in, in terms of the bigger food and health system? Sure. <laughs> Ooh, that was echoey. <laughs> um, yeah, so, well, what I'm really excited to be with you here today. Um, so I am the Director of Food Policy and Strategy for the state of Rhode Island. Um, and my role is to really look at the food system as a system for the state of Rhode Island. So this is a fairly new position um, for the state. Um, started in 2016, I started in 2016. Um, and the idea was really to say, okay, food is a really complicated and strategic thing for our state. It encompasses all of our different agencies, basically. But we've never really thought about it in a coordinated way before. Um, and so I was charged with developing our state's first ever food system-wide strategy. Um, which looks at everything. I have a copy here in case anybody wants to see one later, but um, um, I always bring my props. Um, but um, the idea was really to look at it as a system and to think about it from all the different angles. So we look at everything from agriculture and fisheries and how we grow those industries, the markets that surround them and connecting our makers and growers to, to those markets and growing their markets in our region. Um, things around food insecurity and hunger, food waste, um, and the, just the general business climate for food in our state. And so I'll stop, because I could talk about this forever, but that's the, the food system overall, and trying to understand the interconnections between them is, um, is the vantage point that I have. And in particular, later I was planning to talk a bit about our hunger work and how we try and look at that from kind of a, a systems perspective and a um, social determinants of health perspective as well. Okay, um, so my name's Duck, like the bird. And, <laughs> um, and I'm the executive director of Boston Area Gleaners. What we do is work with farmers. Um, our mission is to rescue surplus crops for people in need. Um, so that's the function of what we do. But essentially what we're doing is working with farmers to help them manage their agricultural surplus and to provide them a no-cost means of donating, which otherwise they would not they're otherwise not able to do. It costs them too much money. Uh, the act of donating costs them the same amount in production costs as it does to take it to market So, uh, and sell it, which, um, uh, so, that, so that's the reason that so much is not donated and the reason that we are now um, about to crest two million pounds uh, for, historic, uh, for our historic total. Um, which amounts to, by the way, we measure it, um, 8 million servings of uh, local fruit and vegetables. So that's significant, and, it, and we're still only scratching the surface of the potential there. So 
great stuff there. So uh, on the academic side, there's certainly a long history of uh, research, but also outreach to farmers all the way through supply chains. But much of that over the past 100 years anyway has been f focused on individual aspects of either food production all the way through to nutrition and health outcomes. I think the, the more recent endeavor and the much more difficult endeavor is to think about, as Sue said, how are those things connected to each other? Uh, they don't exist in isolation. Uh, and there's both synergies and tensions between those different areas. And that's, um, so I'm maybe the only agricultural scientist in the room, if there are any others. Hello. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but as, as Georgia said, I'm, I'm actually, I'm also situated in the School of Nutrition at Tufts. So uh, all of that nutrition stuff that goes on at my school kind of rubs off. So I think about agriculture a lot. I have worked in it for decades. Um, but also, what's the, what are the connections? And then in the real world, kind of what are the motivators and what are the levers that we might pull to be able to accomplish exactly the goals that you brought up at the beginning, which is you know, easier access to healthy foods for everybody, not just for the few. Mm -hmm. And I feel like uh, you know, I represent a very narrow aspect of this discussion, being on the, on the for-profit side. So I'm looking forward to learning a lot from the rest of the folks here. Um, basically, through our work as investors, uh, both through Fresh Source Capital and now with Satari, um, we are representing our investors who um, are usually impact-oriented, so they are looking to have some sort of positive um, impact on the food system. Um, sometimes they define it very different ways. It, it, it can vary a lot from investor to investor. But the overall goal for us is to find and, and mobilize capital into for-profit businesses that have a mission around improving the food system, which is a pretty broad mandate. And that can include anything from reducing food waste to providing uh, food access to underserved communities, um, to um, supporting uh, better food uh, products and services. So we, I really represent, I guess, you know, we're, at, we're at being an intermediary. We have the um, companies that are looking for capital that are trying to have this positive mission, and then we have, on the other side, the investors who want to see their money being used for good. So I want to ask each one of you, first, how do you measure success in your role? And second, how often do you think of the system as a whole? Do you want to now go um, the opposite yeah, direction? Yeah, I'll talk about, sure, in terms of, it's, it's actually always, <laughs> Being in finance, it's always pretty easy to point to financial returns as the um, indicator of success. So that's that's certainly one. It's clearly not the only one. Um, but yes, we measure our success in terms of how much um, you know return we're generating from the companies that we invested in. But very much so, we also look at impact factors. And for us, and again, it's really tailored to the types of companies that we're investing in and the, the needs and desires of our investor base. But we look at um, any things like uh, how many farms are being supported by the, the, the product or service that, that the company has, um, how many households are benefiting from that product or service, um, how much has been um, spent on, in our case, it's, it's regional or local uh, food production, um, how many dollars are being spent on, um, on local infrastructure, and uh, another key one is um, how, many, how much waste are we able to reduce, um, or how, how much less food waste is there because of this particular product or service. So that's, that's kind of how we measure them. We, we do measure on an annual basis, um, and then we also accumulate them so our investors can see um, um, how well they're doing. In terms of the system, um, I think that's, a, that's probably a, a, a better question for some of the other <laughs> folks on the panel who's, who have that more of that. So uh, does this mean the answer is no? <laughs> we do. I, I think it's, it's, it's hard because, um, again, every company that, that's in our portfolio has a slightly different uh, you know, impact on the food system. So we can aggregate those, but you know, for example, when we're looking at food waste reduction, not every company in our portfolio is focused on food waste reduction. Um, so we can measure it for that handful of companies, but we don't really have data for the others. And, 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 that, and vice versa, some companies are um, you know, more focused on uh, food access issues than others are. So we have these various data points and we can kind of aggregate them. Um, what we don't have yet 
which would be great to build towards is sort of the, a goal. For, so what are we actually trying to get to? Um, that we haven't developed, but that, that's not to say that it, it can't be done. Mm -hmm. Tim? Yeah, I think some of the some of the metrics that you mentioned on the private sector side are the same things that we look at on the research side. You know, whether that's profitability, uh, kind of distribution of risk within the food system, environmental outcomes, all of those kinds of things. I guess for for me personally, what I'm interested in, um, both from the academic side, but I do some more policy oriented impact work and and some work with the private sector is is to use research to try to identify where those opportunities are really for mutual gains. So if there are solutions out there that are not a zero-sum game, where you know, we, we hear this a lot in terms of things like uh, policies for that uh, provide financial incentives for farmers to do certain things, and it's a really common suggestion to just say, well, let's stop giving money to this group of farmers and just start giving it to this group of farmers. I get that pretty much every semester in class when I ask. Um, and it, I'm, I'm just not convinced that it has to be, uh, has to be that way. I think there are, are ways that we can think about what those solutions are, um, that uh, if there are benefits to uh, producing and consuming healthier diets, to be able to spread those benefits across uh, both populations and supply chains. And, Partly, we have to just conceptualize that as researchers, but we're getting a lot closer to be able to kind of launch projects that do that. Can you ask a question? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, has anybody quantified the relationship between food system mm -hmm. and chronic health? Because without the quantification, what are we measuring? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there, there certainly, uh, you know, looking at either chronic health or chronic disease, I think that the kind of landscape of what kinds of diets lead to one or the other of those outcomes, you know, are, are relatively clear and, and much better addressed by my colleagues that are actually nutrition scientists rather than agricultural scientists. But, you know, the, 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 on the, on the chronic disease, the ill health side, you know, seven of the 10 leading causes of death in the US are diet related. So there, there's, uh, that research base exists and it comes out of places like where my office is because we're a school of nutrition and a lot of other places. So uh, it, usually that ne the, the assessment there is at the level of diets and occasionally, I mean, you'll see research come out about individual foods, particularly recently on the health side. So are there are certain foods where we can actually identify the mechanism by which it might make you healthier if you ate it or ate more of it? So that's kind of the, the, the daily work of, of, of a school like where, where I'm based. Yes. Yep. Doc, do you want me to repeat sure. the, the um, questions? Sure. Or? So on the uh, quanti quantitative uh, side of that question, we measure success in pounds, uh, in, uh, in volume, the amount that we're able to capture uh, of surplus that would otherwise um, remain in the fields, be composted, et cetera. And uh, on the qualitative side, um, the quality of our relationships with our stakeholders, um, particularly farmers who are the supply source. And um, we know that those, and so it's not just the number of farms that we work with, there are incidentally over a thousand farms mm -hmm. in Eastern Massachusetts, many people don't realize that. And, um, but the quality of those relationships we know are good if we're, if we're able to deepen those relationships and come up with even more creative ways to help them manage their surplus means that that surplus flows through our supply chain. Um, and the quality of our relationships with our, our agencies and um, particularly if we have relationships where there is a flow of information back and forth, not just that they're getting food, but that we're getting response um, for the type of food that they're getting for their clients and customers. 
Is it positive? What's the, um, what's the ethnic breakup of those clients? And um, because we have tremendous diversity in the Boston area, it's wonderful. And there's, there's enough of variety of produce. We, I mean, we rescue over 60 varieties of produce. I mean, everything that's grown across this region, we get our hands on it. Um, and there's a place for all of it. So that's what we try to do. Mm -hmm. Um, for the metrics piece, I'd say I have kind of two responses. One is we have some, in our food strategy, some fairly large goals that we're trying to achieve. Um, so for instance, we subscribe to, there's a group called Food Solutions New England, and they have a, a regional food vision that by 2060, 50% of the food that's eaten in this region will have been grown, harvested, cultivated, caught, manufactured, whatever, within the region. Uh, we're closer to less than 10% at this moment. and so. Um, thinking about how we grow to those kind of big stretch goals. Um, the other quantitative piece is it really depends on the part of the, the food strategy we're talking about. So we have some pretty strong goals and metrics for our, our anti-hunger work, um, for our agricultural work, a lot of the, the things you've, you both have mentioned. Um, and so we have specific kind of like hard data that we, we track to measure each of those. We have a great partnership with a group called the Rhode Island Food Policy Council. Many of your states or, or cities and towns have their own food policy councils. Ours has a really strong focus on data and metrics, so they're actually gonna help us create um, a dashboard where any, anybody can just go and see kind of where we're, how we're progressing on the food strategy. It's a little bit of a, a report card slash, uh, I guess, keeping me honest uh, thing that they're doing. Um, and that'll be available starting in January, and so we collectively picked out some, some individual metrics for each part of the, the food system. Um, and then kind of on a more qualitative side, I mean, a lot of what we're trying to do is create this kind of like atmosphere um, and culture of, of local food and, and food resilience and, um, and our food system. And so some of what we track is more of that like qualitative story piece, kind of like Duck was talking about relationships. Like is Rhode Island a kind of place um, and New England is a whole kind of place where people feel like, um, you know, anybody could be starting a food business where food businesses can thrive, where, you know, we have an increasing number of um, young and new farmers and where we aren't losing farmland at an increasing pace. And so kind of creating that atmosphere is something that also we try and tell through stories um, and less like looking at metrics on a, uh, like on a spreadsheet and more like how do we share people's um, awesome stories like, uh, uh, an example off the top of my head that I was talking to someone earlier, like it's the kind of place where we had a, a really large distributor who was able to distribute to all, all of our K through 12 schools and a really, really tiny food business who really was making a really healthful product that um, met all of our like nutritional guidelines for the schools. And this bigger distributor who's based in province was like, oh, I'll just put it on my trucks. You know, that's just something I can do. Um, and so creating that kind of atmosphere and those kind of connections, um, that's a story. That's not something you can really just see on a piece of paper. So we try and do it kind of from multiple levels and it really depends on the piece of the strategy, which I think kind of gets to the second question of how often do I think about the system? And like constantly, I'm just, <laughs> like most of my job is trying to like break down those silos across agencies and across you know, kind of our mindsets um, and working with folks kind of across the food system, both in the Rhode Island and the larger region. Um, around, you know, it's, when we're talking about, you know, hunger, we're not just talking about, you know, our social services agencies. You know, we have our Department of Agriculture at the table. We have our Commerce Agency at the table thinking about our economic development and how that drives down poverty. And so it's like, how do we kind of break down those silos so we can actually get at some of the under, you know, the root causes of things. Um, so I'm constantly thinking about the whole system, um, which makes it really hard to measure sometimes. You're like, ah, it's like everything all together. <laughs> but I want to touch upon a little bit more about uh, this problem as from a system perspective and how the different sectors that you represent interact with each other, uh, what is helpful to each other and what hinders each other in your opinion. And we can, again, go the opposite direction and start with you, Sue. <laughs> Keep going. Um, I think what's really helped, I think one, having somebody like me whose job it is, is to like break down those silos is really helpful um, because everybody has their things that they're doing. You know, you have the things that you're focused on all the time. Having the time to kind of take your head up and be like, oh, does this relate to health? Does this relate to such and such? It's like not something a lot of us have time for in our busy lives. And so having a point person who's trying to make those connections I think is really helpful. Um, I think the other thing that's really 
like a low hanging fruit is that people want to make these connections. Like an example I give sometimes is our Department of Health, who I just love. They um, house our um, division of food safety. So the guys who go out and inspect all of our restaurants and make sure we're not getting botulism and we're not eating romaine lettuce when we shouldn't and all sorts of stuff like that. But um, they, in developing food strategy, were talking with folks and realizing like, oh, shoot. I think I'm the barrier to why restaurants aren't donating food. Like we're part of the barrier to some of this hunger relief stuff. Oh my God. And then it like lit this fire under them where now they've created this whole new program which they call the Road to End Hunger and they're doing all this outreach to the restaurants that they inspect and helping them and more like larger facilities like casinos and um, like more like large hospitality who, who are generating a fair amount of food waste but weren't. Um, because, or weren't donating it because they were basically afraid of the Department of Health. And so having the Department of Health have that light bulb moment, like, oh, that was us. Like, I think one of the big opportunities is people get really excited when they realize, like, oh, the work I do impacts all these other things that I had no idea because I was just going out and inspecting restaurants and, like, whoa, I play this really important role. Um, so I think that's kind of some low-hanging fruit of, like, helping people see those connections because then they get really excited about it. Um, I'd say the one of the difficulties that we face is just, like, People are busy. You got the ways that you do things. The systems work. A lot of like food systems, like the systems that are you know exist in our food system, exist for reasons. Like they exist for efficiency, and they exist because you know stores are in certain places and make a certain amount of money. And um, you know the government agencies were set up to be very efficient and have like somebody who's thinking about the environment and somebody who's thinking about fisheries and somebody who's thinking about this and someone who's thinking about that. And they're not designed for that kind of like cross sector thinking um, because it's more efficient to like have the person who does their whatever. And so getting people to like have the time and the mental space um, to be able to like pick their heads up and um, really think in that way is really hard. I mean, it's, um, it's exciting when they can, but it's also not how our systems were at all designed. Um, and so that can be a big challenge, just like making the time and mental energy to do that or thinking like, wow, the way I've done this thing for 35 years is not the best way to do it. It's like, kind of a terrifying thing to realize. Um, and you don't want to admit that to yourself. Um, and so even just realize, like, taking that moment to be like, oh my god, like, the way, you know, our the head of food safety, who is an amazing person, it was like, oh my gosh, like, I've been doing food safety for, I think, literally 35 years. And he's like, I'm the barrier. Like, that's terrifying. He could have been like, nope, no, I'm not, and just like stuck his head down and kept doing it, but instead chose to do the other way. And so that's a barrier of just like, that's not how we think. Like it's easier to think in our silos than it is to work across agencies. And if you have, oh, I won't repeat that. <laughs> that was. I Sorry, agree like, with all that. <laughs> no, that was so good. <laughs> Barriers. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> very good. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah. So as a little nonprofit, um, the reason that we do what we do is because there's no money in it. Um, and so, and that's why we're a nonprofit, and that's why we formed, and that's why we scramble around begging for money all the time, because um, there's never really been value put on this surplus. So it's funny. I'm. I think about how we've got to, you know, someday it will be valued more. We're moving in that direction, right? But as soon as that happens, like, non <laughs> we'll be destroyed. Um, <laughs> Which is fine, because that means that um, perhaps things will be working more as a system and and instead of um, uh, as our entire um, economic functions on this myth of endless growth uh, is a lie. And, <laughs> um, and you can, you know, if you, were, if you were a farmer, farmers know that intrinsically. And um, so... Um, yeah, I mean, essentially what we're doing is creating a new supply chain that hasn't existed before. There's uh, the, the total amount of food waste in this country has never been measured because it's such a difficult thing to measure, but it's a minimum of 40% of total agricultural production. And so we're just focused on the um, surplus that remains on farms. And uh, that's some of the most difficult. That's some of the most difficult surplus to access, which is why it's not not done as often. Um, but but I mean, what we're doing is is 
you know, we're doing anything a fresh supply chain does. That's all the infrastructure we need. So if we could have those conversations with for-profits um, to, I mean, you know, we could use some cooler space. We could use some warehouse space. Um, trucking. How many trucks are on the road? How many of them are empty backhauling? You know, I mean, it's just, there's so much potential, and it's a matter of uh, having, having these conversations across these industry lines, so. Yeah, I, I see actually two issues. One is, as a, as a scientist, is, you know, the need to work across disciplines, both physical and natural sciences and social sciences, and that's not the way that most uh, universities train people to do science. Um, I've been luckier than most that I have been doing work across disciplines since I was an undergrad, so it's been a long while. Um, but to, to build on your point, Sue, to, to be able to do that, even to formulate a, uh, an exciting food system question, takes a lot of time and, and literally a lot of conversation. There is no substitute for having people who work in different realms literally in the same room at the same time. So, you know, I've been involved in trying to write grand interdisciplinary grant proposals by email. Uh, it fails every time. Uh, the, the projects that have been successful, you know, even, a, even just a day or two where you could get a half a dozen or a dozen people to say, okay, we've never worked together before. You know, literally, as a scientist, I don't speak your language and you don't speak mine. So we, we do a lot of work in that realm. I mean, that's kind of describes my world as, a, as an academic. But to your question about the, uh, the need to work across the sectors that those of us up here represent, uh, I just don't see any choice. I think for, for some of those relationships, they've been um, more oppositional over in the past than they really needed to be. But I don't see any choice that if we want to solve those complex problems, and, and, and have some innovation there that it, it's gonna, you know, it doesn't necessarily always have to include academia and nonprofits and government and for profits, all four, all at the same time. But we're not gonna solve it if we all work individually in our own realms. There's just, and, and there's lots of, I mean, I get exposed to that stuff both in the private and or the for profit and nonprofit sectors a lot. And there's a lot of really, really interesting collaborations and some unexpected collaborations. M my experience is a little more on the environmental side, the environmental impacts of food production and farming. And, and there's some really, you know, when organizations, whether for-profit or non-profit, decide, you know what, it, what's important is solving the problem and they strike out and talk to other groups that maybe they e either never spoke to before or actively opposed before. There's some really interesting solutions out there now. So I'm 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 an optimist by nature anyway. So I I actually see a lot of cause for optimism on kind of working across these sectors. I I agree, and I think what's really unique and interesting about uh, being an investor in the food system is that we realize that we recognize mm -hmm. that we need to collaborate and. Uh, you know, Sue, you earlier mentioned the New England Food Vision, which is, I think, a great example of, uh, you know, a piece of, of academic research that a lot of folks from different disciplines can kind of rally behind and have as a goal. Um, I'll also just throw out a, um, as a kind of a case study, one of the companies that we were invested in um, through Fresh Source Capital. It's, um, it's a maker of edible seaweed products. Um, it's called Ocean Approved, and they're based in um, just south of Portland, Maine. But uh, they absolutely have tapped into each one of these four groups um, in order to be successful. Um, the reason why I say that is uh, they, over the past couple of years, have moved from uh, wild harvesting seaweed, so just going out you know, and literally w harvesting what's in the ocean, to uh, farming seaweed. So uh, planting, you know, uh, getting seeds from uh, existing seaweed, um, having a nursery where they grow those seeds out and then literally planting them on, on string and then submerging them underwater to, um, to grow their crop. Um, so they've had to very much uh, you know, tap into academic, uh, academia, uh, and they work with some of the um, local universities and colleges in their area to, um, you know, to basically figure out what's the best way to grow uh, seaweed seed. Um, they also work very closely with some nonprofits in the area to help train uh, people who can actually grow the seaweed. Um, and, 
Uh, they also need help from the government because they need the government um, to be able to issue permits to farmers who want access to water in order to grow the seaweed. Um, so I think it's just a, it's a little microcosm, a little mini case study, but it very much um, is a story around how a small, I mean, it's a very small company, but how it has leveraged each one of these four sectors up here in order to try to build a company. Thank you. I cannot let this panel go without asking about how you see, if you see, the role of data in what you do and in the overall problem of access to healthy food. Uh, sure, I'll start. Um, so yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think data is key. One of our um, sort of our kind of key investment themes around why we even you know, uh, go forth with just focusing on food is that um, consumers want better access to data to, and more information about the food that they're eating. Um, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the local food um, movement, as we've seen it, has been very much consumer driven um, and fo very much focused on, on personal health. I think now it has to be taken to a level where it's, it's uh, you know, kind of community and, um, and public health. Uh, and that's where clearly that's why, why we're all here. Um, so clearly I think any kind of data associated with how a food is grown or produced is very important. Um, I think it's also important on the production side. I think um, for probably, the, and, and I would love to hear my colleagues' input on this because uh, you know I'm not a scientist, but it seems to me one of the biggest issues with our food system is that for so many years, we focused our policy on yields, on maximizing yields, and we haven't focused on maximizing nutrients. And I think mm -hmm. the, 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 um, that's what's coming out now is we're realizing that, wow, we're growing all this food, but it's actually not that great for us. It's not really, um, it's not really uh, providing us with the nutrition that we need. So the data around on the production side around what actually, uh, what makes the best, um, most nutritious uh, piece of broccoli, I think that's kind of where things are going to be headed. But I'd yeah, I, I agree on, on both of those um, counts. Uh, we have focused on productivity across pretty much all crops and livestock for a long, long time. I think that's shifting uh, somewhat, and it's shifting because of exactly the reason that we're here today, which is to think about what's the connection between what we eat, which isn't just about mass, it's about what's in that. So uh, on, the, on the data side, uh, you know, if you, our problem on, as researchers is if you, want to, if you want to look at productivity and distribution and risk for things like corn and soy and wheat uh, in the US, the data is wonderful. My students work with it all the time. And then as you go to all of the other categories of foods, including, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on trying to increase eating of fruits and vegetables in the United States, since by and large we consume less than half of what we probably should. Uh, the data that you get from USDA on a lot of fruit, it, the only data point that you get is either a county or a state level estimate of how many acres are being grown. You don't even, you don't even have a crude estimate of total output, let alone what's in it, right? So th that's, that's a problem where the data literally don't exist. And then in other realms, and this is a, a good, I, I think a good argument for how we work across our sectors is, you know, being able to uh, work with the private sector to access data, you know, that is the interface between uh, how food is grown and produced and what people are buying and eating. So, you know, skew data from retailers and those kinds of things. And those get used in very specific situations, but not broadly for a lot of really good reasons because it's private business information. But I, but I think there's a lot of potential actually that for collaboration there to answer some really, really interesting questions. Yeah, I think uh, data, I mean, there's just data all over what we do um, there, and their potential for it, and there could be much more. And uh, thank you for saying what you did, Lisa, about new, focusing on nutrients. I mean, because what, what we're doing is essentially uh, capturing energy um, in the form of nutrients. But agriculture is one of the top users of fossil fuels and water. And I think that it's no coincidence that there's been a lot more focus on food waste as our um, 
as our collective consciousness uh, starts to realize the truth of that we're past peak oil, right? So, um, so we're catch, capturing energy. So it depends on. So we, you know, <clears throat> we're a nonprofit. We we have to pick a subsector. So we're hungry leaf. So we talk about pounds and feeding people. But I mean, it's really <laughs> it's, it's like a much bigger thing than that. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, and I mentioned before that the amount of of this amount that's available on the surplus and in the food waste has never been uh, never been measured. So and it and it needs to be. So we really need to understand what that is. What is being lost? What what is that energy? What is the potential for nutrients for people? What is the potential for animal feed? What is the potential for um, you know, I mean, we need to understand how much fossil fuel we're just throwing away mm -hmm. in water uh, with all of that. So, yeah, it's, it's huge. <laughs> um, all that. <laughs> and, uh, say, data is obviously really key to what we do. Um, to have effective good government, you need to have policy and strategy that's based in like actual data and things that, um, reflect the real world. Um, that's not always how policy is made, which drives me crazy town. But um, if you want to have good, effective government, that's how it needs to be. Um, one example I can give that we're working on is um, I co-chair our Hunger Elimination Task Force um, along with the d director of our Department of Health. Um, and something that we're looking at through that process is um, is doing a deep dive into some of the data that members of that task force, which is both members of the governor's cabinet, but also folks from kind of across the state, so the head of the um, food bank, folks who work on domestic violence issues, folks who work on housing, folks who touch kind of any sort of like poverty relief that would touch on you know hunger issues. We're touching and serving the same people, um, but not sharing data about them, um, and kind of forcing folks to interact with like all of these different systems. Um, and not thinking about them as like whole people necessarily. So one thing we're trying to figure out is can we better share data in kind of, you know, an anonymized, like non-specific way, not like Sue Anderbois is on SNAP and WIC and uses Medicaid and lives at this address. But like in general, um, in this part of the state, we have great, um, you know, maybe in Woonsocket, we have really great uptake of Medicaid services, but folks don't, folks aren't utilizing LIHEAP or um, know about services related to the food bank or whatever. Um, and so we'll be doing kind of a deep dive on how can we best um, and there's a new uh, data, they call it the, the data ecosystem or something, through our Executive Office of Health and Human Services, where they're looking at like how do we better share data across agencies and connect that so that you know if we're touching folks or serving folks through one agency, we can tell like if they are eligible or not eligible for certain things in other agencies um, and can kind of leverage that. So it's less about, you know, we can see like, oh, in Woonsocket, people are signed up for WIC and SNAP and Medicaid, and it's great. But like for some reason in <coughs> West Warwick, folks don't you know who use Medicaid don't know to sign up for SNAP, and so is there an intervention we can have there to make sure that people know what is eligible where? And so that's something we are going to be embarking on in a more serious way. But data is totally key for how we best do our our work. I think at this point, because I could keep asking them questions, but we have three minutes, roughly speaking. So I want to see, I want to hear your questions. First of all, thank you to the panelists. It's uh, been fascinating. Uh, my question is, it comes back to an earlier question about diet and more specifically the move towards uh, or away from meat-based diets towards veganism or uh, vegetarianism. And uh, one, how much of a trend are you seeing? Uh, and two, what are the impacts to the food system? You can imagine what it might do to certain farmers or mm -hmm. uh, producers. Uh, I know in my, my life, we now have vegan dishes at Thanksgiving, where in the past <laughs> that would have been something you wouldn't have thought of. So yeah. um, I'm curious to hear your reactions to that. Oh, I'll start. I'll, that, that, that's one of the primary areas that we're interested in, and particularly the, the intersection between diets that are healthy for people and diets that are good for the planet, Those, that, that uh, linkage. The diets are not changing very rapidly. You know, they're, they may be, in terms of kind of the proportions of different categories of foods, they're probably about stable. And, and I don't think that 
the intake of calories, just energy, continues to increase as it has in the past. It might be a little bit. Um, there's a lot more attention paid to the potential to shift diets. One of the, th one of the issues in the, on the research side, and we do a fair bit of work in this area, is that it's often presented or, or the research is conducted kind of very categorically. In other words, uh, if you took the average American adult diet, what if they all became vegans? Okay, it's a, it's a valid question. Um, how likely is that? So, I mean, one of the things that I'm interested in is, you know, like, what are the, what are the easiest and most likely dietary changes that would occur that move people toward healthier diets, rather than saying, if, you, if you're now eating really crappy diet over here, you, you know, what's wrong with you? You should be way over here. That's not a compelling way to change people's behavior. So, uh, you know, and, and then I, because I work with farmers, by the same token, saying the way that you're growing your food is killing the planet is also not a good way to change their behavior. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm looking for, you know, what, how, do we, how do we be more creative so that we can at least make sure that the train is moving in that direction? On this note, we have really 30 seconds, so <laughs> <laughs> although I would love to get more questions, I really want to thank you for coming thank and you. for a very interesting discussion.